Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Would you stand with us as we worship this morning? so good to just worship your name, to gather together um, and sing your praises. We pray that you would be glorified this morning in all that we do and say. Meet with us here this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome, you guys. Welcome to Discovery Hills Church. Hey, if you are new, we have communication cards in the chair backs in front of you. So go ahead and fill those out. We want to connect with you. Uh, that's also a spot where you can put prayer requests and praises. We want to be praying for you, praying with you, and also celebrating with you. So check those out. Tonight, we have our prayer meeting on Zoom. It is from 6 to 7, and you can log into that with a link that you would have gotten in your email. If you want to do that and don't have that link, uh, ask Jason or myself, and we can get that to you. All right, we have a legacy ministry meeting coming up this Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. It is here at church in the library. So come on out to that. If you have any questions about that, you can contact Sherry Whiteley. Okay, we have some children's ministry needs. The first one relates to um, our dear Alex Salter having her new baby, and I think we have a picture of him. Owen Grant Salter, here I'll move. He's so cute. There he is, and there's Millie holding him. Anyway, she served us um, for our third Sunday nursery worker during our second service, 
And um, so she's going to be needing a replacement for a little bit. So if you're interested in, in serving in that way, that third Sunday of the month, second service nursery worker, go ahead and talk to me. If you're interested, also, we're in need of a helper um, for first service. For our first service, I take all the kids, all the ages in and do some Sunday school with them. Um, and since we have multiple ages, it is really hel helpful to have a, an additional grown-up in there. So if you're interested in helping out first service in the children's um, Sunday school, go ahead and, and you can talk to me. Um, I would love to have your help. Oh, another thing with... Um, with Alex and Nolan having their baby, um, they have set up a meal train. So if you would like to bless their family with a meal, there was a, a link emailed out. Go ahead and click on that link, and you can, you can go ahead and sign up to provide them a meal. All right. Wednesday Club Store. We have one more store for the year. The kids love this. They do store once a month, and it's where they can spend their bucks that they get weekly. And there's a ton of fun stuff in there, but since it's the last one, we are running a little bit low. So if you guys have any fun items lying around the house that you don't use anymore, um, that, that look fun and they're still in good shape, go ahead and bring those in. If you see something at the store that you just think the kids would love, um, go ahead and pick it up, and, and we would appreciate any and all donations you have. You can drop them off at the office with so, or you can give them to me, however you would like to get them to us. We would so appreciate that for our last store. Our last store is May 18th, so we need them before May 18th. All right, and finally, we have our VBS coming up in June. Um, we're doing Rocky Railway, where the kids are going to learn about the power of Jesus, getting them through all of life's ups and downs. It is happening the week of June 13th through the 17th, Monday through Friday, and it's going to be 9 o'clock to noon. Um, so if you would like to register your kids, you can go ahead and do that online. Um, and then in addition, uh, we appreciate all of the volunteers that we already have lined up. Thank you so much. Um, we're in need of a few more. So if you would like to volunteer in any capacity, Capacity, come talk to me, talk to Jason, talk to Pastor Chris, and we would love to get you plugged in there. Thank you. Well, let's pray. Father God, we, uh, we love you, and we're so happy to be here this morning and uh, meeting as your body, Father. We we love to be together, Father, to know each other, Father, uh, and as we learn about being your body today, Father, we, we thank you that you have chosen us and made us part of that, Father. Father, this morning, I, uh, I think of the Muslims across the world that are finishing their 30 days of, of fasting and, and seeking to know God better, Father, and to become closer to God, Father, and Father, we know that they're, they may not know it, but they're seeking you, Father. And I just pray this morning that, that you would give them a sense of discontent and um, that, that, that all these things that they have done for the last month haven't worked, Father, to bring them close to you, Father. We ask that you would call them out, that you would speak to them, Father, uh, in dreams, Father, and, and visions, Father, that you would put people in their lives that would speak to them, Father, that would share your love, that would give them an opportunity to know the God that cares for them, Father, the God that loves for them, Father, the God that they are looking for, Father. We ask that you draw them to yourself. Father, this morning as we give tithes and offerings, we ask that you would bless them, use them for the furtherance of your kingdom. Father, we love you. We thank you for bringing us together this morning. Father, we want to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, Lord, 
with this next song. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove. My Savior lives because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future. 
Jesus, we are so thankful for you, so thankful that we know you, so thankful that your good and awesome plan has brought us close to you. I thank you for your Holy Spirit working and moving in our hearts and in our lives. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would soften our hearts this morning that you would remove distractions and obstacles, that we would receive whatever you have for us this morning from your word. Lord, instruct us, teach us, reveal to us more of who you are, more of your love for us. We just bow our hearts before you this morning in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning. <clears throat> All right. So, speaking of obstructions and obstacles, have anyone have one of those mornings? Yeah, I've had one of those mornings. <laughs> but it's, it's been a chaotic morning to say the least, but uh, I just have to, every, every time, every Sunday, I, I'm, I get the, the privilege of, of speaking. It's even if it's a chaotic, crazy Sunday, I, I come up here knowing that, that God has blessed me with something huge. I never really take that for granted. And, I, and no matter what happens, and even if I'm st like stressed, maybe be before I, I get up here, uh, it truly is a, a blessing to be able to, to share that this is, has been God's calling on my life, that uh, he's brought me here, and, and that I'm uh, able to, to serve in this way, it really is just a, a big pleasure. So, let's dive in. All right, we're in the Discovery Hills Commitments. We're going to be in the people of God. So, last week, we talked about the Word of God. We talked about how when we immerse ourselves in the Word of God, it keeps us from falling for some of the silly myths in, in culture around us. That a, a lot of times it acts like 
not a lot of, all the time, it acts like that, that ballast on a ship where it keeps us centered, keeps us focused on what is true, what God has taught us, what he's brought us through. And then it, it keeps us from, from veering off from, from one side or the other. So this week we're going to be talking about the people of God. So this is the number two part in our four-part series about the core commitments of our church. And so these are the four com- core commitments that not only have some, uh, some nuance for our own lives, but is also a, a directive for the church and who we're called to be as a church. And so we have the word of God, the people of God, the mission of God, and the glory of God. So this is our, our statement as a church for the people of God. It says, we believe that human beings are created in the image of God. Next one. Those who have been justified by God's grace through faith alone in Christ alone and indwelled by the Holy Spirit are the body of Christ. God's people, the church, are special to him and to us. We encourage and facilitate fellowship, defend the unity of the body of Christ, pray for one another, bear one another's burdens, and love one another sacrificially. All right, so we're going to be getting started with this, the the image of God. And we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 1, where it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps along the earth. So first off, God created people with intrinsic value. God created people with intrinsic value. Every single human, whether he or she believes in God or not, has, has value in, endowed by their creator that's built into them. We like to act a, a lot of times in awe of man's great achievement. But in reality, when you, even you look at something as simple as nature, a lot of those achievements are overshadowed. Like a man can jump all right, three times his height, maybe, with a pole. <laughs> Ants jump a hundred times their height. Fleas jump 300 times their, fly, their height. Man can fly with a contraption. Well, great. You ever hear of these things called birds? Flies, hummingbirds, they can hover, they can go backwards. The fastest man can run, not quite 30 miles an hour. And of course, there's plenty of animals that run faster than that. Cheetah, 70, 80 miles an hour. To compare man to anything else in size or speed, nothing. It's puny. But man, as Blaise Pascal puts it, has dignity of thought. He says that the universe could crush a man, yet even a vapor, a drop of water could kill a man. But even if the universe does crush him, man is still greater because he knows he is getting crushed. (laughs) All right. As, As the kids would say, humanity is just built different. So this is the most basic belief about humanity, and honestly, even this has come into, into question and attacked by our deconstructionist culture. Sometimes, and depending on who the person is that is under attack, many people today have a much more visceral reaction to an animal getting hurt or attacked or abused than they do a human. And we often make judgment calls on people's worth based on their God-given ability to contribute to society. A lot of times we discount someone's worth based on what they believe or how old they are, their physical attributes or their ailments or their core capabilities as a person. And all of that is just wrong. It's completely against what the Bible teaches. Psalm 139 says, For you were You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Leads me to this this quick thought, and it might bleed into, into next week, but that's all right, but you get a little preview. Do the people around you that you come in contact with throughout the day, do the people around you have souls? 
Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, of course they do. But let's think about it in, the, in a rhetorical sense. Do the people around you, when you interact with them, when you go to the store and you need to get something done, or you need to buy something, when you go to the bank and you just need to get something processed and get out of there, when you have someone that you just want your tire fixed or your oil changed, or you just want whatever it is done, do those people that you come in contact with, when you're on the phone with Comcast customer service, do, like, does the, do the people have souls in your life? Every single person, it says here, is made in the image of God. They bear the image of our creator. That kid that annoys you at Wednesday club, if you're a volunteer, you're like, okay, top five. Uh, (laughs) They're made in the image of God. The the barista that you get annoyed with because they can't count change or they spell your name wrong. The checker who rings you up and brings, gives you the wrong price for the box of mini wheats that you wanted. The kid that bullied you in school back in, in the day. The boss that blamed you for something you didn't do and then fired you over it. The husband or, or the wife that left you. The cousin that, well, nobody likes. Right? All these people, the, the politician even, even politicians, made in the image of God. So there's an intrinsic worth that we have as image bearers. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that, should re- that all should reach repentance. We all bear the image of God, and he seeks to awaken everything that he's created us to be, everything that he's designed in us. He he seeks to to bring that out of us, to awaken us through his repentance, through our repentance to him. God is patient. Amen. All right. Second point. So, He's created everyone, whether they believe or not, in the image of God. And then his saving work calls us to an identity in him, an identity in Christ. We're going to be looking first here before we get to the main verse. Matthew 16, verse 15 through 18. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God chooses to reveal himself to us. He chooses to accomplish his will through us. Nothing that we have as believers is even ours. Not not our salvation, not our works, not even our faith. It's all because of God. And then we take someone like Peter, and if we read the Bible not knowing what's going to happen, we look at Peter and think, well, this is an unlikely character for God to be building his church. But God uses us. He uses people amidst our brokenness, amidst our, our own faults. He chooses to use us. It calls us to an identity in him. Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 10. 2 through 10. 1 through 10 says this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which, you once, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we've all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath, much like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus." So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one can boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God had prepared for in advance that we should walk in them. So there's this intrinsic worth that he's built into us, and then there's this inherited glory, and then the identity found in him. That not only were we brought into a life bearing the image of the all-powerful God, we're, we're not just made in his likeness, we are then called out of the muck into the glory that he's prepared for us. That while we were still sinners, while we were still destitute, while we were still feeling like a failure, while we were feeling worthless, he called us out. Ephesians uses the phrase, sons of disobedience. Never heard that, but like has a nice ring to it. Sons of disobedience. Like, we're in a club called the sons of disobedience. Like, we have the patch right here. While we thought that God should have no use for me, while we think that, well, what does he want with me? What is he going to do? What is he going to do with the sinner? Like, what do I have to give him? What assets do I really have? I've screwed everything up. I've, my own life, like, what does he want with my sin, my, my messed up plan? I seem to have messed everything up. And, well, that's the thing. Like, your sin, your mistakes... God uses it to show his greatness. What a powerful testimony that God can use a sinner like me. There's this quote that a lot of times gets attributed to Jonathan Edwards, but it's actually by this guy by the name of Philip Melanchthon. Philip Melanchthon. I've been practicing that name. Can't get it. But he was a... <clears throat> he was a, a church reformer, and, and he was a colleague to Martin Luther. He says, the only thing that you bring to your salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. Maybe you feel like you've left your life in shambles. Or you've stumbled so long or, or been tossed and turned all about by the world that you don't even know which way is up. <clears throat> but God created you with the plan. Not only created you with the plan, Ephesians says, Paul in Ephesians says that he created you his masterpiece. Like you're his, you're his Mona Lisa, you're his Fur Elise, you're his masterpiece. You're created exactly as he'd like you to be. Do you think that he can't use you? Well, he can, but that's to be continued because it has a lot to do with what we're going to be talking about later, and that's the, the church. He's planned your place in your life, and it coincides with your life in the church. So you've been, we're not there yet, but all right. You've been created in Christ with the works that he's planned for you. He's known you before you were born. He's knit you together in your, in your mother's womb. Like he knows you intimately. He created you. He's chosen you. As Ephesians 1.4 says, he's chosen you in Christ before the creation of the world. He knew that you would be here. He knew that you'd be in this circumstance or this job or this family or this maybe trial in your life. He's known that you were, you were there. And it talks, even in Acts 17, how your bounds and your time are determined before you even existed. Ultimately, God wants to bring us back to him. Yeah, we're, we're messed up, screwed up people, but through the grace of God, we're restored. God doesn't need anything from us, but he wants to, uh, to use us. He wants us to submit to him and accept his gift of grace. His grace and forgiveness is like him wrapping his arms around us and forgiving us and freeing us from the bondage of sin that so easily entangles us. Ephesians 2, 6 and 7, that, that verse that we read, it says that we are... We are uh, raised up with Christ, and he seats us next to him. So I remember a trip that I took when I was a, a senior in high school. It's a pretty cool trip, and uh, 
This was like right before we were graduating. It was a weekend trip out to this condo. It was a two-story condo in Santa Monica. One of the parents just outright got it, and we were like enthralled. So this is, a, this is before Airbnb was ever a thing. So we thought, how did they even secure this thing? So we were out at the beach pretty much the whole weekend. It was, it was great. I don't remember a whole lot of what we did, but I can remember something exciting happening. We were out, at the, out and just you know, messing around, chilling out on the beach. And who walks up near to us? Uh, none other than Owen Wilson. I know. <laughs> Owen Wilson, no joke. He's out there with one of his friends out on the beach and his friend's kid and all that, and they were playing. And we were so stoked. So like, what do we do? We, la- we went and got our other friends. We're like, you guys have to come see this. It's Owen Wilson. Like, no way. So we were out on the beach, and I had convinced them not to walk up and take any pictures. I thought, well... They're celebrities, yeah, but they need their own life too, and no one was around them. No one even noticed them. So we didn't want to bother them, but what we did instead was the whole time we took arm-length pictures, you know, kind of like, wasn't like this, because those the front fit cameras didn't really exist back then. So we're like trying to do this thing, getting group pictures, trying to get in the background. I do remember one time we had a fully staged photo with someone taking the picture of us. I'm sure he knew exactly what was happening, but probably appreciated that we didn't come say hi. But I don't remember any of those pictures actually coming out. Maybe one person got one. But that was pretty much the most famous person I've ever seen, at least in the wild. (laughs) So could you imagine, though, seeing someone like that, seeing you go to your favorite singer or whatever, and that person not only sees you, but then recognizes you, calls you out. Not just calls you out, but says, hey, you, come up here on stage with me. Like your favorite singer, the president of the United States, someone with immense power and authority calling you out. Be pretty incredible. Well, could you imagine the God of the universe, the God that created everyone, the God that created you, created your neighbor, created everything around you, that holds the universe in his hands. Could you imagine that God calling you out by name and then seating, him, seating you next to him? That's, that's what he's talking about here. Right? Like, How much of an honor is that? It says God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ in order that the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It says that God raised us up with Christ. So we're part of the the resurrection. We are part of the resurrection of Christ. We're partakers in the resurrection of Christ. God raised us up with Christ, seated us next to him in the heavenly realms. Like, what? There's no way. There's no way we could have deserved this. Like, everything in life that we've ever gone through teaches us that we have to earn that acceptance, that love, that respect, that honor. But God gives this to us and more without doing, us doing anything to deserve it. And Christ has given us a new identity and begins to show us the fulfilling calling that he's placed on our lives. So a, a lot of that calling has to do with each other, the church. Here, the, there it is. We got there. <clears throat> so, our core commitment says that we encourage and facilitate fellowship, defend the unity of the body of Christ, pray for one another, bear one another's burdens, and love one another sacrificially. So, there's a there's a passage in the Bible that describes what church should look like, and it, and it creates a, a metaphor for how the church is supposed to operate and view themselves. So a lot of this stuff is, is well, how do I take it to heart? Well, this is not only that, but it's also, well, how do we? How do we take that to heart? What does that look like? So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians. 
chapter 12, verse 12. It says, For just as the body is one and is many mem- has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into the body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? I just every time I, I'm sorry, I didn't say this first, but every time I see that, I just picture tons of, I don't know, it's weird. It's really weird. But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need to you need for you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are the indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, and with which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, given, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. There may be no division in the body, but but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all members suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So there's kind of a commission there. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. And are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. So there's the individual, and then there's the body. And each member of the body has a role. So let's just take this metaphor at face value for a second. How many of you this morning have thought of your spleen? (laughs) Or maybe at all? Great. Thank you. Because if you did, you would ruin my metaphor. (laughs) I didn't actually even know that much about the spleen until one of my friends was in the hospital trying to save his spleen. And it's actually, you know, pretty important. You can live without it, but it filters your blood and all that. It's pretty important. How many of you have thought about your pancreas? Not just today, but maybe ever. Okay, a couple. Usually people with, uh, like, someone with, like, diabetes or something like that in their family have thought about their pancreas. I've thought about my pancreas before. And uh, I know, so, like, some of you. How many of you have thought of your knees or your back or your neck? Yeah. A lot more. So there's, there's parts of the body that tend to be on our mind more, parts of the body that tend to fail us more, and these are often the parts that we think about. Or maybe just the really important ones, right? Like our eyes. But how many people do you really know that live without their eyes? Like a lot, I was thinking about like, Well, this ruins it because I don't know anyone. But I know they exist. I've seen them on YouTube videos and stuff. (laughs) But how many people actually know someone who is living without a liver? Well, no. This passage talks about the church as if it's a body. Profound because I don't think much... Uh, I don't think much of, about anything that my body does. In fact, most of us probably go through life kind of expecting things to work without even realizing it. God says that we belong to each other. Not just here in, in, in church, the little C, but we belong to each other in the big C church, the church at large. 
If one of us hurts, the rest of the body hurts. If one of us is broken, the rest of the body feels broken. There are parts of the body that do more than others, sure. Maybe a lot of us want to be eyeballs, but some of us are pinky fingers. Maybe, maybe we want to be the lungs, but some of us are the appendix. One of the things that, that fuels my passion for ministry is to see people involved in the church in the capacity and the gifting that God has put in their lives. To see people involved in the local church, like this right here. How many times have I seen someone standing on the outside of ministry, hesitant to jump in, only to see them jump in and see their passions ignite within the community? How many times have I seen people come alive after finding their fit in the local church? And that, that maybe even some of them, the tightest community they've ever felt, as some of them have admitted to me. The tightest community that they felt amidst these, the trenches of service with their brothers and sisters. I think it's vitally necessary for the church to act like the church. What I mean by that is that Christ said people are going to know that we are his by our love. The love for each other, the love for for people around us. And it happens through service. It happens when we know each other. That happens when we build community within ourselves right here. And when we find that place that God has design, designed us for within the church, we come alive. And it makes it so much easier for us to, to be an active member of the body of Christ in the local church. And when you see the local church mobilized, when you see the, the, local, the local church acting in this way that God has put forth, that God has called the church to be, when you see the church acting in these four core commitments and every way that the Bible outlines and Jesus outlines the way the church is supposed to act and Paul outlines the way the church is supposed to act, the way that Peter commissions us to press through, the, when we see that happening in the church, it leaves a wake as it moves. It leaves a wake behind it of goodness, of love. It leaves a wake behind it. The Bible talks about it as an aroma. When you see the local church mobilize, it's a force to be reckoned with. And we find, when we find our place that God has designed us within the church, we come alive and, and are fulfilled in a way that is not met by anything else. We all have a part to play. And God has given dignity and honor to all those parts, as this passage says. We are given the image of Christ. We are, are given an identity in him. We are given more honor than we ever deserved, and we are given each other. And then when we, if we step back from that, if we step out of the life that, that God has called us to, if we, if we say, all right, well, like we talked about last week, if we step back and we're like, forget it, I'm done, and we, we give up on everything that, that Christ has called us to and step back into our old life, it's like this, this author named Don Everts, he'd put it, it's like a man wanting to hang out in tombs and snuggle with coffins. It's like a two-month-old child trying to crawl back into his mother's womb. It's like someone who's had their knees replaced or hips replaced, just refusing to ever walk again. It's like a, a prisoner who's gotten out of prison Choosing to go back and just meander about in his dank old prison cell on the weekends. So this is crazy. It's like a, it's, it's a denial of the amazing life that God has offered us. As, as it's put, Jesus describes it, it's like an extravagant feast set before us. And he calls us 
to partake. He calls us to partake in the life identified through him and the life lived in love with other people. Let's finish off with this. How then should we live? First, see others as image bearers. That people around you, when you come in contact with them day in and day out, that they are created in the image of God, bearing his image with works that he's planned for them in advance. Realize all God's called you to be. And lastly, find your place in the local church as a member of the body of Christ. Would you pray with me, please? God, I, I thank you for all that you've called us to be. Thank you for drawing us out of our old life and calling us to a new life in you. That I pray that we would, would live as if we identify with you. That we would live uh, this extraordinary life that you have called us to amongst our local church. And that we would rise to, uh, to your calling and your image as, as believers, as a, as a body. God, I, I pray that as we now take communion, that we would reflect on all you've done for us, that, uh, that we would uh, just be able to, to take in uh, all that you've, you have uh, brought us to and brought us out of in thanksgiving. Thank you, and I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. said to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After they had eaten, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me.
stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Yeah, the way you see. 